All right, so cell reproduction. It actually consists of two specific kinds of cell reproduction. The one that we're going to focus on first is mitosis. And then the second kind of cell reproduction that we'll get to next week is meiosis. It's important that you understand both um, for purposes of genetics, which is our next unit. If you don't understand cell reproduction, you're going to struggle when we get to genetics because understanding there's a lot of references in the genetics unit to chromosomes and DNA and how the chromosomes divide and split and things like that. All right, so for starters, why cells reproduce in the first place? Number one, to allow us to grow. Obviously, we started off as a single cell. That single cell didn't have organs. It didn't have arms, legs, brains, none of that. It was one cell. All it had was the DNA. That cell has propagated into millions of cells, which is now you. So in order for an organism to grow, cells have to divide. Secondly, to replace cells that become damaged or worn out. Not all of your cells are made to last your lifetime. Skin cells only live like 35 days, for example. So you are constantly making new ones to replace the old ones that get worn out and flake off of your body. You're also replacing your blood cells. About every 120 days, you've replaced your, all your red blood cells. So there's a lot of cells in your body like that that need to be replaced as your life uh, continues. And finally, to make more organisms. In multicellular organisms like us, we have specific cells that are designated just for reproduction. We make sperm and eggs for reproduction. We don't have skin cells turning into human beings. Um, we only have specific cells. But in a single-celled organism, that one cell, when it divides, basically has made a brand new organism. So making more organisms would be the final reason why our cells divide. The one thing that is passed on from cell to cell in division is the DNA. The DNA ultimately has all the instructions necessary to build a complete organism, even a complex uh, multicellular organism like us, all those instructions in that DNA. So um, that's the most important thing that is passed on when cells reproduce, even though, yes, there's some mitochondria in there and, and cell, other cell parts. Um, in a single cell reproduction, but the DNA is the most important thing. All right, your genome. So this word is very popular these days. Genomes, the Human Genome Project, genomics. Um, your DNA, all the DNA in a single cell is your genome. And all of your cells have identical sets of DNA. You can pretty much get a DNA sample from almost any cell. Um, if anybody's ever done, for example, like Ancestry.com, you basically just spit in a tube. And there's enough DNA in the cells of your spit that they can extract and, and map out your genome. Um, there's also DNA in bone cells, in blood cells, you know, all kinds of cells. And in prokaryotes, your D the DNA is a single molecule, one chromosome. It's a loop. We've talked about that before. In eukaryotes, there's multiple DNA molecules. Does anybody know how many we have per cell? Any, how many chromosomes? 46. 46, yes. 23 pairs, which makes 46. Sperm and egg only have 23 because of meiosis, which we'll talk about. But all your other cells should have 46. What a chromosome really is, is a way of packaging up your DNA. You cannot see chromosomes all the time. You can only see them when a cell is dividing. We're going to talk about why that is as well. So again, um, all of your cells have a full set of chromosomes. Even though your cells are specialized, even though bone cells don't look the same as a nerve cell or a skin cell, the same 46 chromosomes are there. It's just that enzymes control what DNA is being turned on and off, so your cells specialize. The 46 chromosomes are there, but they're not all awake. Only certain parts of certain chromosomes are awake in each cell to give that cell its specific jobs. All right, so we're going to focus on eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells have their DNA, as you already know, in the nucleus, and it's typically found in a mass called chromatin, or can also be pronounced chromatin. And chromatin is about 60% protein, only about 40% DNA. In fact, when scientists first started studying um, DNA or heredity, they, in the early 
early 1900s, they thought that the protein was the most important thing. Because chromatin, when they, when they looked inside the nucleus, it was more protein than DNA. So they assumed that the protein must be the important part. We now know it's the DNA, obviously, that's the important part. The other thing about DNA is that DNA has an overall negative charge. A reminder. So DNA is a nucleic acid. Nucleic acids are built out of building blocks called nucleotides. Nucleotides consist of a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. The bases are A, T, G, and C, which we'll talk about another time, but you probably remember that. A connects to T and G connects to C. The phosphate groups, if you go back to our great biochemistry chapter, I know everybody's a fan, look like this. Phosphate has four oxygens. And it has a bunch of negative charges. So because of that, DNA has an overall negative charge. The importance of that is that DNA, the protein, remember how chromatin was 60% protein. The proteins are called histones. They look kind of like these. And what, it, what happens is <clears throat> the DNA being negatively charged and the proteins being positively char charged, opposites attract. So the DNA will actually uh, wrap around these, they kind of look like round beads, and the DNA sort of wraps around them like this. So the strands of DNA are organized by wrapping around these proteins. It's a way of keeping the DNA nice and straight and organized so that it doesn't get all tangled and, and, and clumped up. Here's a diagram of what it looks like. So you think of DNA, you probably think of a double helix, which we will talk about a couple chapters down the road. We're not even going to talk about that right now. This double helix gets wrapped around these little balls here. These are the histones, which coil up and coil up and kind of super coil into a chromosome. Here's a, another diagram. So this little segment of DNA here, this double helix, would make up just this one little portion here. And that gets packed into these tight, what are called nucleosomes. And then this whole section would be just one little tiny piece of this chromosome. I know you probably can't read at the bottom here because you're kind of far away. But basically what it says is that the DNA is now 50,000 times shorter when it's packed into the chromosome. So if you were to unwind a chromosome, it would be 50,000 times longer than the coiled up version. The other thing is, and I've given this example before, remember DNA has a job. The job of DNA is to code for making protein. But in order for it to do that, you have to think of the DNA as sort of like a book. In order for you to read a book, you have to open it, you have to be able to see the pages. So if I'm trying to do a bunch of work on my desk and I've got papers and I've got my, my iPad open and everything else, I've got everything all spread out so I can read it and follow it and, and do stuff. But if I wanted to carry my stuff to another room, I would pack it all up. At this time, please. All right, so anyway, um, what I was going to say was, yeah, so if I was going to take my stuff down the hall, I'd have to pack it all up tightly so nothing gets lost. So when your cells are doing their job, when the DNA is making proteins, it has to be uncoiled. It has to look kind of like a bunch of stringy mess. If you ever, anybody uh, extract DNA from strawberries? Probably freshman year. All right, and it was probably just this white stringy stuff. That's because that's pretty much what chromatin looks like. That's what the DNA looks like when it's going to, when it's going to be doing its job, when it's making proteins. When the, when the cell's gonna divide, that's when the DNA coils up into chromosomes because we don't want any pieces to get lost. But when the DNA is coiled up, it's like me closing up my books and stacking everything up. I can't do any work now. I can't, everything's closed. But nothing's gonna get lost when I go down the hall as opposed to if I was carrying all my stuff all open, I might drop something. So when the DNA is gonna, when the cell's gonna reproduce, the DNA coils into chromosomes. Some sections of your DNA stay coiled up forever. Those sections
sections are not expressed. They know that there's huge sections of our DNA that's dormant. It never ever codes for anything. We're not even exactly sure why. Maybe it came from an ancestor and it was something that was functional then but isn't anymore. That's why when they do stain chromosomes, which we're going to look at next week, you're going to actually see that chromosomes have these dark bands. The dark bands are areas of DNA that are really tightly coiled. They typically are areas that don't code for anything. They're ne they never get red. They don't code for proteins. The lighter areas usually code for stuff. All right, last thing. We're going to stop here. The structure of a chromosome. So chromosomes are basically one side of a chromosome is one long strand of DNA. So technically a chromosome is just one long double helix. But keep in mind that that double helix is coiled up 50,000 times into a tight, tight thing. Sort of like if you've ever uh, done any sewing and you wrap thread around a, a spool or a ball of yarn to keep stuff organized. Basically, the DNA is all coiled up like that, too. But technically, if you were to unwind it, one side of a chromosome would be one strand. Chromosomes don't look like X's until the DNA makes a copy of itself. Technically, the two sides of a chromosome are identical to each other. Exactly identical to each other. So the two sides are called chromatids. And what holds them together is the centromere. These are usually often called, not just chromatids, they're usually called sister chromatids. And that's because they are exactly identical. All that happened was that the DNA is getting ready for the cell to divide, so it made a copy of itself. If you were to take a brain cell and condense the DNA, the chromosomes would not look like X's. The chromosomes in a brain cell would look like sticks. Because since that DNA is not planning, if that cell's not planning on dividing, there's no reason for that chromosome to make an extra copy of its information. So chromosomes in a cell that's not going to divide would not look like an X. They would actually just look like a stick. The purpose of the X is going to be for mitosis, which we'll talk about next week. All right, so that, that's where we're going to stop. I told you we wouldn't go too far into this today.